Almost four months ago, the hate-watching gods delivered unto us a prime cut of meat for us to sink our teeth into in the form of Rebel Moon Part 1. And now, Zack Snyder has graciously gifted us with another piñata to go to town on in the form of Rebel Moon Part 2, The Scar Giver. In retrospect, the first entry should have been titled The Scar Giver, because we'll probably never rid ourselves of the scars left behind by that Dumpster Fire 9000. Yet, somehow, Snyder actually found a way to make Rebel Moon Part 2 worse than Part 1, as he managed to fix none of the problems plaguing the first entry while adding whole new problems to the sequel. The buzz heading into the release of Scargiver, or more accurately the lack thereof, was very telling in regard to how the first atrocity, A Child of Fire, was received by audiences. There wasn't nearly as much in the way of marketing going into the sequel as there was with the first entry back in December. I saw one ad for the movie, and only the day before it was released. It didn't get the limited theatrical release that the first part did. It didn't even appear on Netflix's homepage on release day when I opened up the streaming app. It wasn't listed under trending or even the curated popular tab. And it was the sixth movie listed under the new release section. Now while that doesn't bode well for the franchise, it is a promising sign for fans of good movies, as Rebel Moon Part 2 was laugh out loud bad. We'll get into the nitty gritty on how Zack Snyder managed to burrow under the incredibly low bar set by this movie's predecessor, right after we get in a recap of this sequel. So here's your official spoiler warning, at least as much as you can spoil a sack of steaming turds. Unlike Zack Snyder, we actually value your time, so we're going to keep this recap as brief as possible. But while this is going to be a high-level summary of the story, it actually still covers most everything that happens because not a lot actually happens in this film. So we start off with Anthony Hopkins doing a narration of pure exposition that's name-dropping a whole bunch of people and places that have never been explained, and thus mean literally nothing to anyone but Zack Snyder. We then see Admiral Noble, whose name is so stupid that he might as well be named Admiral Admirable, is very much alive after his supposed defeat at the end of Part 1. The heroes, if you can call them that, return to the quaint little farming village on Velt, where the droid has replaced the O with a U and becomes some kind of druid droid. Korra thinks that Noble is dead, but they and the locals must still prepare for the coming Imperium assault. They spend eight minutes of runtime harvesting all of their grain in slow motion in order to provide the grain as requested to the Imperium. In reality though, they intend to hold the grain hostage and literally hide behind it so the Imperium can't just blow them up from orbit. Through flashbacks, we see that Korra was ordered to kill the magical princess on the orders of Belisarius, who orchestrated a murderous coup of the royal family. Korra is then blamed for the murder and is forced to flee into exile. Back in the present, the heroes lead the villagers in their effort to make their home defensible. On the eve of battle, we get two scenes to finally address who all these valiant heroes are and what circumstances gave birth to their individual fights. One is a scene where the villagers give them handmade banners meant to symbolize their personalities and backgrounds. The other has the heroes sitting around a table as we go one by one and watch flashbacks of the horrible memories that made them who they are. The next day, right on schedule, the Imperium shows up where they analyze this brilliant military strategy the farmers have employed. And there and there, they stacked to discover to shoot from. Clever. Hmm. What a brilliant idea, using cover during battle. How did these farmers ever come up with that? The Imperium ships roll coal down to the surface, bringing to bear a frightening fighting force of 27 troops. And after an uninspired meeting between Noble and Korra, things pop off. During the fighting, Korra and Gunner sneak aboard the Imperium's dreadnought. Meanwhile, on the ground, the Jimmy droid magically appears in the middle of the battlefield and Deuce Ex Machina's the Imperium forces. Aboard the Dreadnought, Korra manages to plant some bombs on the ship's core before she comes face to face with Noble. The two duel with their totally not lightsabers as the ship is falling apart, climaxing with Korra cutting off the Admiral's head. After Korra and Gunner escape the ship and crash land on the planet's surface, they see the remaining Imperium ships closing in on them. But before any tension from that reveal is allowed to build, the rebel chick from the first movie, who has not been mentioned in this movie up to this point, shows up and deletes them, saving everybody. Except Gunner. He dies. At the end, Korra comes clean about her past and who she really is. 
well after everything is already decided, when the reveal has no consequence and can provide no tension. At the mass funeral, we learn that the murdered princess is apparently still alive, and the surviving characters all vow to band together to save the princess in a sequel that everyone is praying never gets made. It's really over. It's... Thank fuck, yes, Rebel Moon is over. Please bury this IP and never disturb its resting place. This movie was simply hard to watch. And not just hard to watch because of its horrible storytelling, its puddle-deep characters, its ideas lifted straight out of other fantasy franchises, or its overuse of lens flares and slow motion. But also because of Zack Snyder's complete, cringe-inducing obsession with the idea of Rebel Moon. And we'll get to that in a bit. Surprisingly, in a movie given as ominous a name as The Scar Giver, it took a full 56 minutes for anything of import to happen, and it ran for 65 minutes before the first drop of action fell from the spigot. How you can go that long without anything of interest occurring, while also managing not to develop your characters, build any tension, or make the story compelling in even the slightest, is something of a small miracle. You'd think that even on accident one of those things would happen, but no. We need eight minutes of slow motion harvesting and lens flares out the ass. Even when the action did start to flow, it was nothing to write home about. There was nothing new or innovative or even spectacular about it. And everything is made all the worse because this movie has this air of self-importance the whole time. And when contrasted with the actual level of reverence people have for these movies, it just makes for an awful experience. Just like with Rebel Moon Part 1, Zack Snyder's signature blend of overused, meaningless slow motion is still a headlining act in the sequel. But while it wasn't as big a problem here as it was in the first movie, a new glaring problem reared its head in Part 2. Literally a glaring problem, in the form of lens flare. And holy lens flare, Batman, there's a lot of it. Nearly every other scene features gratuitous, distracting lens flare that blocks out half the shot. One of the other major criticisms of the first movie was that it introduced all of these characters to the squad of heroes that had essentially no backstory or even lines of dialogue once they joined up. And part two tried to rectify this in the worst way possible. The two scenes that were supposed to replace actually developing characters this time around are laughably bad. First, you have the scene where each character receives a banner that's supposed to symbolize who they are, while the villagers narrate each character's backstory and character profile. They're just given flags instead of character arcs. And the second scene literally just went around the table and served up flashbacks of the characters' early lives and how they ended up where they are and who they are. And all in slow motion, of course. So in the only attempts Rebel Moon made to give some depth and meaning to its characters, we're never shown who these characters are, we're just told who they are. And the movie thinks this Tinder profile approach to character development is sufficient. That's okay, just make sure to stay subscribed for the 8 hour Snyder cut for each character's backstory, that will still be shit. Without any kind of depth to these characters, we're just left with the surface level attributes they bring to the table. And on that front, who would want to tune in to see a team up of an anime witch, Tarzan, the Bradley Cooper wannabe, and the weird girl who's so forgettable that her prom group forgot to swing by her house and pick her up. You're never made to care about any of these characters, so it just feels dumb when you're asked to buy into their stories at the end. And so many things just didn't make any sense. Like how characters will just <laughs> emerge in scenes wearing the most outlandish, out of place shit. Or like when these 10 guards walk right past the 14 large, blinking green bombs planted on the ship's core. Or how the villagers are just immediately good at all of their training. Or the Imperium not only taking five days to show up, but letting the villagers know when they're going to show up. They already know that their man on the planet has betrayed them and sided with the villagers, but yet they tell them exactly when they're going to show up. Or worst of all, all the storytelling built around this fucking grain. The Imperium can't attack in full force so as not to risk destroying the grain they so desperately need. How is the amount of grain produced by a village of 50 people irreplaceable on a galaxy-wide scale? And why, in a universe with this level of technological advancement, is grain even all that important? Then later on, the Imperium just starts blowing up the grain anyway. So the singular plot device that set the stage for this fight literally goes up in smoke. And with such little thought put into things like those, you just end up with so many stupid lines and just 
bizarre scenes like these. The brain is our most powerful weapon. Do it. What are you waiting for? No. Do it. Kill her. It's the Replotax. The entire rebel fleet. But of course, the genesis of all these problems is the man, the myth, the pretender himself, Zack Snyder. Snyder has been gushing about how incredible Rebel Moon is as a franchise. He's been talking about making this a whole massive IP to build upon, because of course the creator who stands to make millions or billions off of his own verse wants that to happen. He's working on, apparently, four more Rebel Moon movies, and comic books, and TV shows. He's even developing a video game that, in Snyder's words, quote, is just literally insane, and so immersive, and so intense, and so huge. Well, I think we know where the writing quality of Rebel Moon came from. Rebel Moon is just hard to watch with the added context of how Zack Snyder views this franchise. Right now, he's just that weird kid with his one thing that he and he alone is obsessed with. And he's jumped into the deep end, but he's the only one in the pool. No one sees this franchise in the same way he does, and it's not because he's a visionary, it's because he's lost it. Lens flares and slow motion do not equal storytelling. These two movies, put together, feel like they were written by a 10-year-old, which is pretty much how old Snyder was when he apparently conceived Rebel Moon. So we have to wonder, has he not touched these scripts since then? Some of the visuals and effects look decent. That's the only aspect of this movie that feels even remotely professional, much less palatable. If I have to say something else good about the movie, I laughed hysterically at how fucking atrocious some scenes were, so I got a good laugh out of it. Rebel Moon Part 2 flip-flops between feeling like a bootleg knockoff fan-concept C-tier movie and feeling like a parody. And in the end, of course, we're giving it the certified hate watch label. In some aspects, this really was a true hate watch in the sense that it can be fun to sit back and laugh at. Now we want people to take risks and try new ideas and develop new franchises, but the ideas need to be good and original before you start running with them. You shouldn't get this far down the road with an IP that isn't worth a one-issue comic book, much less a movie. Lucasfilm supposedly rejecting this idea was one of just a couple things they've done right in the last decade. And believe me, having Lucasfilm stare down their noses at you in this day and age is not a position you want to be in. Did you bother to return for another ride on the Zack Snyder Slow Motion Express? If you did, how many times did you laugh out loud during this epic space opera? Is this the end of the Rebel Moon, or will the Snyderverse push forward alone? Let us know in the comments below. Remember to leave a like on the video if you liked it, and consider subscribing to Hate Watchers for reviews of other current shows and movies. Thank you for overdosing on slow motion and lens flare with us today, and we'll catch you on the next one.